He has extensive experience of both teaching and training subject content in British and European primary young learner contexts. She's authored books, online courses, and written articles for journals on content and language integrated learning, or CLIL. So, over to you, Kay. Hello. Welcome from me to today's webinar, The Importance of Teaching Content to Young Learners. I'm delighted to be leading this webinar and look forward to answering your questions about the teaching of content at the end of it. Thank you for the polls. It's great to see so many of you from different contexts. And also, we have people from all parts of the world. Thank you. I'm going to start with an overview of the webinar. There are three questions I'll address. They are, when was content noticed in young learner English language teaching? What do we mean by content? How can teachers motivate pupils to learn about content? I'll summarize by addressing the question, so why is it important to teach content to young learners? As you can see from this slide, teaching content isn't a new approach. It's an approach which has been gathering momentum for some time. In 1991, look what was written in an ELT book. Content should be paramount in determining language to be taught if children want to learn how to me in English. In 1994, the term CLIL content and language integrated learning was first used. It's important to note that content is first in the term. In 1996, a completely new set of language books was published for young learners aged from between about 10 to 15. And on the book cover, content is an important element. Content and concepts which reflect students' own lives, interests, and studies. Many schools still use these books today in reprinted form. In 1999, COIL's 4 C's framework of CLIL was used as a planning tool. Again, content came first, followed by communication, cognition, and culture. All of these four C's are key elements of integrated content and language learning. By 2006, content and language teaching in schools was making policymakers take note. In a survey of content and language teaching carried out in schools across Europe, it was stated that the CLIL was of unusual interest. By 2007, a wide range of research had been published about content and language teaching in primary and secondary school contexts, not only in Europe, where CLIL started, but also in Latin America and Asia as well. In 2009, books written by content and language primary teachers in countries such as Spain, Italy, Austria, were published. An example is CLIL across educational levels from teachers in Spain. Also by this time, ELT publishers were taking note that content and language learning was no longer a trend, it was a reality. Young learner course books such as English Ladder in 2012 therefore promoted content learning on their covers, a clear feature in every unit focusing on core subjects such as science and maths. And then in 2014, the British Council recognised that a new strategy for content and language learning in Europe was needed. The first step towards successful schooling is equipping learners with the language for thinking about the content. In response to the steady evolution of content and language teaching in primary schools, more content input is appearing in the majority of new primary ELT course books. Having looked briefly at the evolution of content teaching, I'm now going to address the second content their question, what do we mean by content? 
First of all, we'd like you to write your idea by finishing the sentence, what content is in your, the chat box. So if you start with content is, could you complete that sentence? Don't make it too long because of time. Thank you. All right, we've got some good ideas coming in here. Yeah, different subjects, text, pictures, hmm. cultural subjects. That's an interesting one. Oh, yeah. Thank you. We'll wait for some more here. Yeah, concerning subjects, information about subject matter. Cross-curricular lessons, interesting subject. Oh. All right, so yes, thank you. Most of you have the right idea about what we mean by content. I'm going to move on now, but I'm going to read all of these again later. Thank you. So yes, content is a subject-specific language needed to think about and communicate ideas about concepts from school subjects. For example, subjects such as science and art. Look at what's happening in these four content language class classrooms in Europe. In the top two photographs, you can see Austrian pupils learning about science content. On the left, the topic is how spring flowers grow. And on the right, the topic is edible plant parts. You can see the children, they're very involved in examining plants. In the two photos below, the subject is art. And these are Catalan pupils. On the left, they're learning about portraits being made through the use of fruit and vegetables. And on the right, a boy is exploring shapes to make a spider's web. This topic, therefore, combines learning about art and maths, possibly some science too. In addition to content from subjects such as art and science, content can be from any school subject, whether it's geography, history, maths, music, physical education, as many of you have pointed out here in your comments. And here you can see examples of content from a range of primary ELT books. When we teach content, it's important that we know what is appropriate content for different age groups. It therefore helps when we know the subject topics of the first language school curriculum. And then we can see what's appropriate for different ages and stages. But we also need to examine the language needed to learn about new subject content in English. Let's look at how we can do this. What we need to understand is that there is a close relationship between content and language, and learning outcomes, in my opinion, show this relationship. Here we have a, an example from the subject of geography. Look at the three learning outcomes to be able to identify and describe types of settlements, here a city, a town and a village. So pupils first identify them, then they need to be able to describe them such as this is a big city, it's got very tall buildings, and many people work here. There are many types of transport. Secondly, for these learning outcomes, pupils need to be able to compare types of settlements. Therefore, they need to communicate facts about settlements using comparative forms. Towns are bigger than villages, but they are smaller than cities. There are many people, houses and shops, they don't have big airports. Thirdly, the learning outcome shows that people need to know how to use an identification key. Identification keys usually have a choice of photographs for them to, to select from. But in order to use the key, pupils ask questions about settlements. So they need question starters, such as, is it? Has it got? Are there many? Then pupils feel more confident and they're encouraged to be more accurate. 
But when we know the learning outcomes, we can see that the content and language are completely integrated. I've addressed the first two questions. When was content noticed in young learner English language teaching? And what do we mean by content? And now we'll explore the third question. How can teachers motivate pupils to learn about subject content? In order to do this, I look at three stages in the content and language lesson. Introducing new subject content, presenting new content vocabulary and concepts, exploring and thinking about new subject content. So now we'll find out how teachers can motivate pupils during these stages by looking at an example of teaching content in primary contexts. First, to introduce new subject content, it's important to activate pupils' prior knowledge of their topic. In this example, new content is presented with a captivating photograph and a question about the concept. The question being, where is food from? By looking at the photograph, this encourages pupils to say words and that they have already learned in previous lessons. <coughs> Excuse me. These words could be milk, eyes, ears, nose, mouth, legs, green, blue, smell, hear, touch. Perhaps pupils will also say words such as farms or cows in their first language. Teachers can then translate these responses. But photographs such as these also stimulate um, pupils' curiosity and lead them to ask questions such as, what's this? Where is it? Is it a big animal? Secondly, to present new content vocabulary and concepts, we can motivate pupils by using photographs of real objects such as those of plants and animals. Photographs help pupils to understand the world outside the classroom. In this activity, pupils classify the source of food by saying plant or animal. But how can this vocabulary really come alive? The answer is to be able to provide stimulating video footage of the new content vocabulary in context. So let's now watch this short video which supports learners' understanding and processing of new content vocabulary and a new concept. As you watch, think what you like about it. Alistair, thank you. Can you play it? Where is food from? Let's buy. Find out. Plants.
Well, I hope you enjoyed the video. I'm now going to look at the next slide. I'll just give you a bit of time to keep thinking about what you like. And you have some very positive ideas here. So let's look at this. Um, what do you like about the content in the video? If you could put a tick beside three of these features, um, choosing from A to F, the three features that you like about the video. Three ticks. Ah, great. This is really interesting. The range of plants and animals. Meaningful context people like. The way it's presented. And the idea hmm, about the meals from around the world. Right, so currently, unless the statistics change, are three features which most people like are the new language and the meaningful context, the range of real plants and animals, and the way the presenter delivered the content. Well, that's great because that um, shows us that this idea of the world outside the classroom is important. Um, but also the meaning of a new concept for perhaps young learners is not overwhelming. It's been shown uh, so that they understand it. And I think with the presenting, yes, the use of the swipe board, the speed of delivery, and the friendly presenter also help under, uh, learners uh, enjoy this. I'd like to point out also C, the food being prepared as well as growing. That's very important in the science concept of food from the farm to the plate. So that's possibly um, for subject teachers might be an important point too. Thank you. Oh. Okay. All right. So the features of the video that we also think are important, the dynamic audiovisual support to hear and see new content vocabulary and context without being overwhelmed, which is what you liked. The clear explanation of a concept with age-appropriate examples to show a simple process, the science concept, food source, food preparation, plate. The range of plants, foods, and meals from different countries. So there's a focus on culture. I noticed someone said uh, the cows are, are, are different in, in, in different countries. We agree. Um, but we tried as best as possible to have a, a wide range of um, different countries represented here. Also, for me, the names of some additional plants, such as cucumber and red peppers, are introduced so that more able learners can learn more vocabulary. So there's sort of inbuilt differentiation here. You don't have to just stick to the, the list uh, in a beginner's wire list. Thank you. So. We've seen how we can motivate pupils when introducing new content and when presenting it. Let's now look at the third point, ways of motivating pupils as they explore and think about new subject content. Designing interactive activities motivates most pupils and also develops critical and creative thinking as well. Here you can see two follow-up activities after the video. The activity on the left, number three, develops pupils' lower order thinking, such as remembering and understanding. Pupils identify and classify the sources of food, which are now shown in a different state from the photos in activity one. Food here is either ready for eating, the peeled banana, or has been prepared for eating by heating in some way, such as the barbecued chicken and boiled egg. Pupils at this level, level one, are therefore helped to conceptualize and apply their knowledge of basic food in order to identify which is from a plant and which is from an animal. In other words, starting to develop critical thinking skills. The project on the right, activity four, develops pupils' creative thinking. If pupils are unsure of the sources of food and drink, which they draw on their own posters, 
teachers can ask the rest of the class if they know. Or if no one knows the word in English, teachers can draw and say the name of the food and its source. If pupils draw manufactured food, for example, tomato sauce or perhaps some butter, ask pupils, is tomato sauce or butter from a plant and an animal? Concept checking with questions such as these develops reasoning skills because uh, pupils are required to think how fruit, vegetables and animal products could be changed to make food such as sauces. After finishing the poster, Learners can be put into pairs to comment on each other's work using language previously learned. For example, I like your food from plants. What's this plant? What animal is your food from? Commenting on one another's work from early stages encourages the early development of evaluating skills. Clearly, it's important that pupils progress their thinking skills or they won't be motivated to learn. Look at these questions that follow learning about new subject content. They are for pupils in higher levels of primary. The questions here develop higher order cognitive processes. This is because the questions involve some analysis, differentiating between content vocabulary and then making decisions. So learners need to consider which feature in art, which place in geography, which means of communication in science, or which measurement in maths is relevant for the responses. And you can see how the cognitive processes involved in the decision making for most eight to nine year olds are less demanding than those needed for 10 to 12 year olds. These type of questions therefore do more than personalize learning and encourage pair or group work because they develop thinking skills too. Well, we've seen um, some subjects and topics already in, in this webinar. Um, we've seen the science and the food topic. But what we'd like to know is what other subject topics do your pupils like finding out about in your lessons? Write one subject and a topic that your learners like to learn about? Oh, okay, food, sports, astronomy, nature, wow, oh, astronomy, wildlife, music, yeah, dinosaurs. Okay, really good range here. All right, thank you. Football still coming in. Okay, so let's look at what I found out in my own uh, teaching in Europe, what they like. Science, animals, planets, art, patterns and shadows, geography, maps and volcanoes, history, castles, fossils, music, instruments and sound, and as many people have said up, uh, on the on the chat box, physical education, sport, sport, sport. Uh, so we can explore and think about new content also by making cross curricular links. We saw earlier in the webinar the boy making the web, and I explained that it was a combination of art, maths, and some science. But also, um, we can look at art, for example, landscape paintings with the vocabulary, river, mountain, sea, link it to geography with physical landscapes, coasts, mountains, deserts, link that to history, uh, looking at old settlements, where, where are they often placed, near rivers or in valleys. Uh, and then link that to perhaps sources of water, uh, where we find water, wells, springs, rivers, and seas. So by making links between subject content, we help pupils understand how connected our world is. Subjects cannot be learned in isolation. They're very linked. However, we can also encourage learners to explore and think about content by giving them short texts to read especially at upper primary levels. Here are two extracts from texts for older pupils. The first extract on the right is from geography. It's an explanation of how a volcano erupts. The second extract on the, on the right is 
uh, from history. But if we look at the, the first extract on the left from geography, teachers can help learners notice language commonly used in, these, in the, the topic of, of geography. So, for example, time adverbs such as before, when, and after are highlighted in red italics. Present tense verbs are highlighted in blue to show that a process goes on and on. In the description of life in the past, on the left, I'm sorry, on the right, teachers can help learners to notice language such as past verbs in blue and useful phrases and prepositions in red italics, such as in the past, far away, and inside. By helping pupils to notice language used in different school subjects, and this enables pupils to be more confident when they're writing their own explanations or descriptions, not only in geography and history, but also in other subjects such as science or art. Model texts from different subjects therefore help pupils develop subject literacy. Our fourth question for you is that you saw an example of an explanation from geography and a description from history, but what other types of non-fiction texts do your young learners read and perhaps write when learning about school subjects? So tick in the poll any example that your pupils have read or written, or add another example um, in the text box which they're familiar with. All right, so many have tried instructional texts for, for example, a healthy sandwich. Okay, recounts, telling what happened in the past or what they've done in an experiment. Uh, descriptions, yeah, all right, of, for example, of a habitat. And fewer with a persuasive text, that's more demanding, possibly for the higher levels in primary. All right. Okay, so thank you for these. What I'd like to say is that one important difference between ELT lessons and content and language lessons is that subject content usually involves reading and or writing non-fiction texts. ELT tends to have more examples of poems, songs, cartoons, scripts, and story. However, this is not to say that learners in content teaching in primary don't read short poems or cartoons related to the content topic. They do, and they love them. All right, let's now look at my final point related to exploring and thinking about content. My final point, and I think it's an important one, is that for many teachers and pupils who enjoy working with content, it's hard to find materials that develop pupils' subject knowledge in English across all levels of primary school. Young learners who are keen to find out about a subject topic, as such as animals, as many of you wrote, um, if it's presented in one level of an English language course, they find out that the subject content isn't explored in the next level or subsequent levels of the course. So if we look at these three tables, examples of developing and linking subject content across different subjects and levels are color-coded. If we look at the science topics in red, and these are the popular animal topics, you can see that um, a link develops uh, so that pupils' knowledge of animals is developed from beginner to higher levels. Animal movements and needs in the earlier stages, nocturnal animals and animal groups in the middle stages, underwater food chains and animal communication at higher levels. You can also see the development of art content in purple writing, types of art, landscape painting, shadows. Types of geography in green, for example, places on a grid, types of settlement, reading maps, and physical education in brown, sports equipment, body movements, strength, speed, stamina, balance. 
Notice how linguistically challenging subject contents, such as found in history, perhaps uh, in building materials from the past, um, and also in music topics in orange, for example, sounds string instruments make, isn't presented until higher levels. I'm sure you can see other links that were planned for content teaching across all levels. I'm going to finish the webinar with two more short video clips from popular primary subject topics that develop content learning. You watched the first video, Where is Food From?, which is a beginner level video earlier. Now you'll see video two, Which Animals Are Nocturnal? This is for level three, working towards movers level. And then you'll see a third video, with the introduction only to what is an underwater food chain. This is aimed at higher levels of primary. While you're watching, think of a way that content learning develops from the first level to the second and to the third. All right, Alistair, thank you. Today, we're asking. Which animals are nocturnal? Thank you. And the third clip, what is an underwater food chain? This is only the introduction. Today, we're asking Let's find out Thank you. We'll just wait a few moments till everyone has seen the video and keep thinking how you think content learning has developed from the first video you saw, plants and animals, to the nocturnal animals, to the underwater food chain. Koalas. If you would like to write one idea in the chat box, We'd be grateful.
All right, I'm going to move on and show you in a table how. Yes, all right. So, yeah, great. So people are thinking of simple, more complex things, and also more complex language. Somebody wrote. Thank you. All right. So let's look at this. Um, we can see from the table that I've divided this into three parts, the subject content and concept first. So content learning develops from what children can see and have knowledge of in their first language, for example, plants and animals, to learning about a science concept that they can't see, an underwater food chain. And without and which, without clear video footage, can be hard to understand, even in first language. So the, the subject concept is developed. Secondly, thinking skills. So content learning develops thinking skills, from identifying and classifying at the animals. beginning, and then to interpreting animals that sleep during the day or at night, and then analyzing parts of a food chain. Thirdly, language. I've divided language development for learning about new content into word, sentence, and text levels. At word level, content vocabulary is at starter, starter level in the beginning, for example, animal, eggs. Um, by mid-primary, bat is used, First, but also other look. nocturnal animals such as koala and fox are not in the vocabulary list at this level. At upper primary, Sleep with the food the chain. Day. Um, pupils heard start and eat, which will be familiar to them, but the new nouns, such as producer, consumer, belong to more academic vocabulary of school subjects, in this case science. However, with rich, visual, comprehensible input, most children will understand the new content concepts presented in English. At sentence level, the language develops from one clause sentences, the food is from, eggs are from, people eat. To one and two clause sentences with the nocturnal animals, and then into more complex sentences involving when and how and sequencing adverbs. Koalas At text level, you, you heard a simple explanation of where plants and uh, where food is from, a slightly more a lengthier explanation of nocturnal animals, and then into an, the explanation of a four step process for science. The water food chain. So the planning um, is across the whole range of books. Uh, it wasn't limited to one level. So how can teachers help pupils to learn about new subject content? We've, we've looked during this webinar uh, at ways in which teachers can help them to understand process and communicate ideas about subject content. Teachers can introduce new content by activating learners' prior knowledge of the subject, as with the cow picture. They can present new content by providing a language-rich, multimodal experience, such as the, the activities you saw in the video. But they can explore new content by designing interactive, interactive activities that encourage pupils to develop critical and creative thinking skills. Um, also through projects. Um, they make cross-curricular links and by developing pupils' subject literacy the morning, with the text afternoon. examples you saw from geography and history at higher levels. And the final point you saw was the developing of content knowledge, not just language knowledge, but content knowledge throughout a course. So I'd like, like now to sum up the webinar the by answering the question, why is it important to teach content to young learners? For me, content motivates and arouses curiosity. Eat each other. Pupils want to explore the and communicate their ideas about age-appropriate subject topics which they enjoy. Content introduces language for thinking the lion about looks like this. content. Content develops subject and language competence. Content develops cultural awareness. It develops critical and creative thinking skills. Develops subject literacy, provides a cross-curricular multimodal experience, 
and above all, is fun. So thank you for listening and responding during the webinar. I'm now happy to answer any questions you may have for me. Thank you very much, Kay. And thank you everyone who's been sending in questions. Don't forget, of course, that there's still time for you to send in a few more questions. Um, first question we've got, Kay, is from Joanna Andronicu, who says, um, what do you think tree. about the, the idea that within the classroom the teacher should only speak? Um, sorry, do you think that in, in the classroom the teacher should Fish. only speak English or is speaking the mother tongue of the learner okay as well? Uh, that? Well, that's quite a, a controversial question. Mm. Um, unlike an ELT, uh, the some judicious use of the first language is acceptable in sea lion. some situations. I don't think, think it's acceptable um, for the teacher to, to, to change into L1 um, unless it's a very, very good reason. And some good reason may be, for me, comparing new content language. So, for example, when I was teaching in the Netherlands, and we had bread around the world, we compared the word bread in English with bread in Dutch and with bread in the other uh, languages that, of its students who were in the classroom. So they, they like to hear, is the word the same? Is it spelt the same or is it... Walk around in that, in that context, eat. I think that's, that's okay. But I don't think it's a good idea to um, use instructions in English um, at all. Okay, thanks. Um, question from Isabella Pesquino, who's um, who asks about um, the fact that the, these videos well, are uh, about um, students receiving language, but um, how do we then move from that to the students producing language? Good question, Isabella. All right, what we didn't show you, um, apart from the, the two activities, you saw the one where they had to um, decide which, at word level, what the food was. Was it from a plant or an animal? So it's a sort of a single word level. And there were speech bubbles to help them do that. You saw the project where they're, they're producing their posters and where I added in the speech. idea of, of giving feedback to each other, Sunlight. what they liked about the poster. But clearly, um, I didn't show any activities from, a, from an activity book, which um, any well, most primary course books supply activity books with um, ideas for production of language. So, yes, you saw more input than production, but it, it is all there in a course. Does that help? Hey, thanks. Yeah, that's great. Um, question from Marisa Lobato, um, who often finds that parents want the lessons to be very demanding. For, for learners so that children can learn to speak quickly, which can be quite um, stressful for young learners. Do you have any suggestions on how to, uh, how to deal with that? <laughs> well, um, again, in my own experience, uh, when I was teaching maths through English in the Netherlands, in the primary, um, parents, we, had, we decided to have meetings at the beginning of the year to explain that there was a longer period of perhaps silence for, for children. But by the end of the year, with the meaningful input and opportunities to, to talk, uh, they produce language quite well. And I think it's something that parents should know from research, that it can take one to two years for children to be competent in their basic English, English, but it can take up to five years in language contexts to um, be more competent uh, at expressing themselves. Okay, thanks. Um, a question now from David Howe, it's quite an interesting one, I think. If the students don't actually yet know the vocabulary in their own language for something, but are still interested and engaged in a topic, do you think it's too early to introduce that Lexis in English? Um, David says that it happened to him in his class with concepts of evaporation and condensation in the water cycle. Yes, well, I think it's, it's fabulous that we're introducing concepts which they're interested in, in English, and it's so much more meaningful. But what's, what's, as I said to you, what's very interesting 
very few teachers have a class of children who are mon from a monolingual background. So that words such as evaporation, condensation, um, you can also use that in L1, but ask in other languages, what are those words, if, if the children know them. Um, but it's this, it's this content and language rich experience. Uh, and I think that that's a good use of, of using some L1. Not, not if, they, if they don't understand the concept, but just as a comparison of language. Okay, thanks. Um, had a couple of questions about correcting students, um, particularly yeah. during um, building speaking skills activities. Um, how how do you do this without um, yeah you know, without um, inhibiting them? I don't see this as any different from an ELT class. There's this context um, because I don't think any teacher wants to keep stopping children to ensure they're accurate. And there are times when we would like them to be accurate, which is why I gave you an example of question starters, because often that's quite difficult for children. So if they get question starters, it helps them to produce more accurate language or gives them some confidence. Um, but recasting, um, once the child's finished their contribution, um, you recast it correctly so that the whole class hears asking another child to, to say it. Um, I mean, there are many ways of, of correcting. It should all be positive. But for me, not interrupting um, in, in, in mid-sentence. Yeah. OK, thanks. Um, question now from Anna Xavier, who asks um, how you make uh, assessment reflect the integration of content and language. To, to make sure that you're assessing both elements um, appropriately. Thank you, Anna. Again, that's a, a very common question in training courses. If you remember the slide early on about learning outcomes, and the learning outcome shows a content and language, um, uh, what they children have to, have to achieve. So if it was comparing settlements, they need comparative forms in order to be able to compare them. So when I'm assessing, I'm talking about formative assessment in the classroom, some children may only say town big, uh, sorry, city big, town small, um, in which case I'd help them to, to, to make the comparative, assuming that they know the comparative forms from ELT classes. Um, or you're going to have to provide a gap fill or, or something to enable them to produce that. So you're assessing the children that can compare settlements without um, your support, those that need some support, and that those that need considerable support. And if the majority can do it, then you can move on. But if not, you're going to have to address um, the vocabulary of the of the subject, but also the language required to do the, the comparing. So you have to look at learning outcomes, really, and learning outcomes should reflect the importance of the relationship between content and language. Content leads the language that has to be learned. Okay, thanks. Um, question from Chris Carmo, um, who asks um, how you'd link. Um, Using this content with um, with technology, I think are there any particular ideas you have for using technology to make the most of this content? Um, I'm not sure if it means the child using the technology or the teacher. Uh, uh, I think either. Okay, for the children, um, it, it depends on the subject topic. Um, this is what takes a lot of time for teachers um, to find extended. Uh, or materials on the internet with um, input that uh, reflects the age of the child. There are plenty of native speaker, very good materials out there. But when you're talking about content, they're very often too advanced. So either using, you know, a, a silent, uh, sound off native speaker video, um, 
which is for the teacher to use with the children. But for the learners themselves, uh, unless it's planned and created for them, uh, it can be quite tricky. Okay, thanks. A uh, question from Uku Nahadi Hathman, who says, um, my school still allocates some hours just to teaching grammar or to teaching reading skills specifically. Do you think that's, that's still relevant, that's still a, a workable approach? Within content teaching, it could be if we're looking at a, a, a text process approach, whereby the examples you saw, let's take the one in for geography, um, about a, a process of a, a volcano, um, they could look at a content text and um, deconstruct it, looking at the different language used and what other process could they apply that to within the subject of geography. Um, um, I, I don't want to give any opinion about if it's right or wrong, but it, it, I'm not saying. I mean, I think it can be done, and it could be could be done quite meaningfully through jigsaw activities, through you know, getting uh, the students to speak. Um, okay, thanks. That's all I can say. That. Thank you. Question: Question from Christine Sutro Chandley, who asks, how you'd go about then consolidating the content that you've taught. I, I'm not sure if, if this is referring to what we saw in this particular webinar, but consolidating must involve a different task. So if you're teaching the, uh, the subject about the plants and animals and the, the food sources, um, you would have to think of a, a very different task to enable them also to use that. So whether it's a role play or something very different, um, uh, there are many ELT activities which you can use uh, in content learning as well to to um, consolidate. But you, I think consolidating, you have to decide is it for oral uh, improvement for speaking and listening, or do you want to consolidate the written um, or, 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 write, or reading, you know, it really depends on, on the, the skill you want to consolidate as well. Yes. Okay, thank you very much, Kay. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for today. So I'd just like okay. to thank you for another a really interesting presentation that's certainly got everyone talking. Um, thank you very much to everyone who's attended today, particularly to my colleagues Camilla, Charlotte, Flo and Melissa, who've been um, answering questions and, and tweeting. And to say that um, if you'd like to catch up on the webinar, um, the recording will be posted on our blog. Um, we've got the, the link to the blog there, and um, Charlotte's also put it into the chat. Certificates will be sent out automatically um, by the end of this week. So those will go out automatically. Um, it'll be a PDF that you can download that you can put your name on. Um, and we'll be announcing another series of uh, series of webinars very shortly so there's no webinar next week we'll have another series very shortly so we'll let you know when that happens and it'll be up on our events page as well so the recording will be on our blog and on our youtube channel and please if you found this useful like us on facebook or follow us on twitter to get much more information but thanks very much everybody and thanks particularly to uk thanks very much Pleasure. thank you thank you okay, thanks.